feel free to take a seat, friends. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, good morning. Glad to be here with you this morning. Um, we're going to now turn our attention to Scripture. We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians. So uh, you can follow along on the screens, or there's a Pew Bible. If you brought your Bible, well done. Extra bonus points. That's always good. Um, and uh, as, we, as we look at the Scripture this morning, I just invite you to open your heart um, and approach it with a posture of uh, expectancy that God is uh, wanting to uh, move in your life, to communicate to you, to bless you by his word. And so as we, uh, as we go to this living word that can inform and give our lives um, what it would need uh, to thrive and to be uh, in a place of purpose and mission, that you would come with expectant hearts looking to the Lord to speak to you this morning. With that in mind, would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, we ask now that you would do the work that only you can do in this place. Father, we come uh, and we ask that you would, uh, would uh, give us the gifts that you desire to give your church that you would help us to get away all of the noise and distractions so that we can hear from you, that we can come to know you. Uh, and Holy Spirit, would you move in fresh ways, in creative ways, in uh, ways that bring us into unity and wholeness as we learn from uh, 1 Corinthians this morning. Precious and holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to do the first 11 verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, first 11 verses. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between the spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Uh, there is a seminal theologian named N.T. Wright, and he tells the story of a people in a desert town that just so happened to be digging in the right place when one day out pops the spring of living water. And it's beautiful and nourishing and wonderful, and the people gather around and they celebrate what they have discovered, and they continue to dig, and to their surprise, they find more and more springs of living water. But as years go on, and the springs continue to flow, managing the streams became a problem. In some cases, the springs would create inconvenient flooding, so people wouldn't get to where they were going fast enough, and there would be mud, and they'd get messy. 
And then in other cases, the water would get contaminated and become unuseful for drinking. As these problems persisted for years, eventually it led the people to decide to pave over the springs and to create little spigots where just a little bit of water could come from the spigot. But over time, the springs were so alive and wild that they broke through the concrete, for they could not be contained. N.T. Wright uses this analogy to explain the last 100 years of spirituality in the West. That during the Enlightenment, with all of its great innovations, the scientific method, uh, modern scientific thought, that really spirituality was sought to be paved over and given a domesticated small role in the life of the person thought perhaps that eventually it wouldn't be needed anymore but as the modern world turned into the postmodern world these springs of spirituality rose again through the cracks these living springs that are present here in this place and are part of who we are as human beings and just cannot be denied as much as we may try at times to domesticate them and to limit them. And so this morning what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at scriptures teaching to this church about what we do with these springs. This Holy Spirit that desires to give gifts to his church. And church, I want you to pay close attention this morning because I need you. I need you to understand the gift that God has given you through the Holy Spirit that is for the edification of the person next to you, the encouragement and service of the person next to you in the pew. Sometimes we can begin to think that the Spirit's work is the work of the vocational minister or pastor. But the reality is what we have just read has taught us in verse 7 in particular, now to each one, now to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit. To each and every one. And so if there are unmet needs within the life of our church, spiritual needs unmet, yes, talk to pastor. But pastor's job is to equip you and to invite you to step up and to understand your spiritual gift so that you can meet each other's needs within the life of the body of Christ. So today what we're learning is really how to operate with our gift so that we can do that healthily, so that we can really learn to use what God has given us through the Spirit to serve each other well this vibrant spiritual life that God wants to uh, continue to flow through the life of St. Andrews and also wants to teach us how it might flow so that it can bless and give life and nourishment. Bruce Bugby writes, spiritual gifts are divine abilities distributed by the Holy Spirit to every believer according to God's design and grace for the common good of the body of Christ. So would you, as I am preaching this morning, just start a prayer in your heart. God, what does it mean that you have given me the gift of the Holy Spirit? And what does it look like when everyone, as John Wimber used to teach, when everyone gets to play? How do we make this journey as a church from consumer to contributor, from merely receiving to getting in the game and pouring oneself out. 
Now, of course, it begins by learning and growth and receiving what God would give, right? And that's important. As we look at this church, as we look at this messy church, if you've been journeying with us, as we've been looking at this uh, church that has all kinds of really complex uh, drama that we look at and we go, man, we got some drama, but they had some drama. Like, this isn't a, a church with it all put together and buttoned up. They got it all figured out yet. But yet, alive within this church are potent spiritual gifts. And so one of the things that we have to pay attention to here is that a gift is given to a messy people. There is no magic formula There's no perfect person that gets to receive a spiritual gift. That they are given to a messy, broken church still in process as they are given to messy, broken people still in process trying to figure out what it means to be a good Christian in 2022. And yet, I think one of the big limiters for us is right at the front. We think spiritual gifts that I've I've just read are for those who have some level of superiority spiritually. That spiritual gifts only go to those really, really, really good Christians, those really faithful Christians, those really perfect Christians, and so I'm not one of those Christians, and so I could never experience what's being written about in the scripture, and yet if we think about who Paul's talking about here, we see that's really not the case, that this church was given spiritual gifts, and we see that they're doing the same bad things with their spiritual gifts that they were doing with their human knowledge. As we've seen, uh, uh, they did with their human knowledge, right? What did they do? They, they wanted to uh, use it as a ranking system to distinguish between different classes within the life of the church, making certain classes in the church more prominent and seeking uh, positions of authority based off of their human knowledge. Uh, and the same thing now is happening with spiritual knowledge, with the knowledge of their spiritual gifts. And so what's happening outside the church is now happening inside the church with a new kind of knowledge, right? Certain spiritual gifts are being elevated above other spiritual gifts, and Paul is looking at that and saying there is a new way to be. It doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to use the gifts that God gave you to hurt one another. It seems surprising to us on the surface when we say that, that we could use the gifts that God gives us in order to hurt each other. But if we think for a moment and could maybe be a little more honest, we do have within us this temptation, right, to look around and to start comparing and to say they have something I don't have or I have something they don't have. And in our minds, we create a little ranking system of where we fit and we get competitive and we get drawn to power. And we like elevating certain gifts above other gifts because it helps us organize our world and know who's in and who's out, who's deserving and who's undeserving. And yet this teaching is so important for all of humanity to begin to understand what it means to truly be together in functionality in a way that works. So verse 7 really helps us, right, to Each and every one is given a spiritual gift, but those spiritual gifts are for what? The common good. A man from Chicago decided to travel to to Wisconsin to go duck hunting, and he shot and dropped a bird, but it fell into a farmer's field on the other side of the fence. As the city city slicker climbed over the fence, 
a dairy farmer drove up on his tractor and asked what was going on. The hunter said, I shot a duck and I'm retrieving it. The old farmer replied, this is my property and you're not coming over here. Well, this made the hunter mad, so he said, if you don't let me come over the fence, I'll call my friend in Chicago who is a lawyer and I will sue you. The farmer smiled and said, apparently you don't know how we do things out here in the country. Here on the farm, we settle disagreements with the good old three kick rule. I kick you three times and then you kick me three times and so on back and forth until someone gives up. <laughs> the hunter looked at the old farmer and knew that he was much stronger than he was, so he decided to do it the farmer's way. The farmer climbed down from the tractor and kicked his heavy work boot into the man's shin. The man began to hop on one foot. The second kick went directly to his groin, causing him to fall to his knees in pain. The third kick went to the man's stomach, knocking the wind out of him. After a few minutes of gasping and moaning, the hunter slowly got up and said, okay, old man, now it is my turn. The farmer responded, Nah, I give up. You can have the duck. <laughs> but isn't it true sometimes that we argue and we fight not so much because we're concerned about the truth, but simply because we like to win the argument. I was listening to a, a teacher, a, a spiritual uh, formation in my spiritual formation class and she's an educator of educators and she said that when she teaches new teachers how to teach when they get into the classroom one of her tips is she says that eventually one of the kids in your class will say something and it will function like throwing out a rope they'll say something provocative and it'll be like as if they're throwing a rope out to you and then you have a decision to make, which is, are you going to take the other end of that rope, and are you going to start playing tug-of-war with that kid? Or are you going to say, I don't want to take the rope. What's your name? How do I see you? And this struggle for power that can even creep into the church, this tug of war that can even creep into the church, even over the gifts that God gives freely, gets so in the way of what God wants to do for our common collective good together. There are just simply things that we cannot do as individuals. And so we have to learn how to be together. One way that this can subtly creep in to our thinking without us even knowing it is just simply from the perspective of our gifting. You see, some of us are really gifted at hospitality. And so subtly we think that the church should be driven towards the best events possible. And we think that should be the focus of the church. Or some of us are gifted at teaching and preaching. And so we just think if the preacher could just preach a little better, then things would really start to cook around here. Or some of us maybe even have a prophetic gift. And so they may say, wow, this church is kind of dry. If only they could get a word from the Lord, then they would know that the Spirit is alive. You see, based off of the gifts that God has given us, he's given us different gifts as a church. And so we can even say, we could either say, my gift should be the focus of this church, or we can say, hey, in uh, my gifting, I have a role to play in service of this church, and somebody else is going to have a different gift, and they're going to come and contribute in their way, and we're going to learn how to bring forward all of the gifts that God wants to give us and learn how to unpack them. Now, these gifts are given freely, but there is a reality that in order to really understand and to cultivate them, that we need to steward them. 
There's a sense by which as we read the Gospels, we see Jesus say that he gives gifts to people, but by how they interact with these gifts, they can either create more life, more abundance, more kingdom, or they can get buried and diminished and fritter away. They can get paved over and lost. One of the ways I've been thinking about this Um, because you know how pastors think. As I've been driving on on PCH recently, I know many of you have been driving on PCH as they've been doing the construction there. You've been spending a lot of your time, your thinking time, maybe your anger time, your anger processing time, uh, just sitting at those lights like, okay, so now we're down to one lane, right? And and I can't even get anywhere I want to go in the time that I want to go. Every single day my commute takes that road. But really the reason it's down to one lane is because they're trying to expand, right? That eventually we're, we're going to greater capacity. And it has been uh, true in my life that there's a way by which when God is preparing you to receive a gift, that there's a singular focus and sacrifice that often accompanies this greater expansion. Like when God wants to do something new and significant in your life, you may be going down to one lane for a season because once you get to five lanes, you have the humility of the one lane to remind you that this really wasn't something that you earned so much as something that God blessed you with. And so when you come to community with that gift, you just hold it differently. And you say, you know, God, I don't understand all the reasons why you've given me this gift, but I know it's not just for me. I know it's for the blessing of the people around me for the common good. So two simple things this morning as we think about our spiritual gifts. Would you first, if you're in this category and you walked in this morning and it's always just been paved over for you, this whole conversation about spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit that feels a little uncomfortable to you and you don't really understand what pastor's talking about when he's reading that list or uh, what's really going on with spiritual gifts, I just pray that there's little cracks in the pavement. That there's just little cracks that say, you know what, maybe there's something more here that I need to pay attention to. And really all that has to look like is you don't have to go read a bunch of books. You, don't, you can do all of that equipping. But really, if you would just spend a little bit of time honestly asking God about it in your prayer, to begin to just pray, God, what spiritual gift have you given me? God, would you give me a spiritual gift? Would you might discover, as you continue to pray that over a season, that there would be some answers that would come to you. That's been true for me, and so I just give you that as a testimony, that as I've been praying these prayers for long enough that I have seen God answer these prayers. Or others of you, others of you are influential, and you have obvious spiritual gifts. But one of the things I've been noticing as I've been doing some coaching is, Sometimes parents tend to get a little big. And, and when parents get big, then the kids get small, right? And so there's this way in which we have to hold our significant strength in a way of love and service as well and not, not get so big that we forget that there's other spiritual gifts in the room that matter that need to be honored and acknowledged, and they're not the upfront ones, they're the ones behind the scenes, but they're keeping things functioning. And finally, if you feel like you know you have a spiritual gift, but that spiritual gift isn't as visible or acknowledged, and you feel like other people are shining and and get the platform, and and you're serving, and you've been faithful, and you just really haven't been seen, uh, may you know that uh, God, God acknowledges your work, 
And that truly what Paul's lining up here is that uh, we play for an audience of one and that we're unified in the spirit. We're all doing the same work and some have very visible gifts and some have uh, gifts that are behind the scenes, but it's all one. It's all just one functioning together. So we rise together, we fall together. And uh, ultimately, our mission is accomplished together. And so if you're in one of those three categories, I just pray that God would, would move in your life. Well, let me pray for you now in that way. Lord Jesus, uh, move now to, to unleash gifts of the Spirit, Lord. Would you just give your Holy Spirit in profound ways to those who are opening up to your work. Lord, we want to see uh, your kingdom in all of its power. And as we do, Lord, would you make us humble? Would you humble us and just show us that it's because of you and for your glory and for the sake of those around us that you want to give us these wonderful gifts. And Lord, would you just show how proud you are of those who have been serving faithfully year after year for your church, Lord. Would you give them a sense right now of how much you love their service and their commitment to this body. In your precious and 